It's a very short course on propagation. If you don't answer, answer, if you don't ask any questions, it's going to last maybe 10 minutes. So please ask questions if you have a question. Okay. Propagation. What is it? What causes it? How does it affect communications? And where I'm going to really uh, get into it is how do we read and understand the charts and where do we find the information? Well, of course it's a means of transmitting a signal from point A to point B. And there's three types. Direct wave, ground wave, and sky wave. We're mainly going to be talking about uh, sky wave tonight. Uh, of course, direct wave is a uh, line of sight from point A to B and you can kind of think of it like your HT to the repeater. That's your direct. Ground wave follows the curvature of the Earth, and it's mainly for low frequencies. It seldom gets above about 2 megahertz, so 160 meters is all you're going to be able to work on ground wave. Yes? One question as we go, or you want, to wait, want us to wait? Go as we go. Okay, so on, on following the curvature of the Earth, what's happening? Why is it hanging to the curvature of the Earth? It's vertically polarized for one thing, and you'll notice all your broadcast stations are vertically polarized. I don't know why it follows, how, what the physics are to follow the curvature of the Earth. Dig into it. Okay. Give us a presentation the next time. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and of course the further it goes, the weaker it gets. I think it's fair, fair to note that, that every time you transmit, you've got the whole three of these things potentially going on. Oh, yeah, so, possibly. So I think that's the, the other part. It's not like it's one or the other. Right. But ground, ground wave is, and, and ground wave is generally at night uh, right. overridden by a sky wave. Usually... Uh, very high incident F2. Sometimes E skip, but not very often. Anyway, the sky wave is refracted from the ionosphere, and notice I said refracted. Uh, a lot of people say reflected. There's only one wave that's reflected from the ionosphere, and we'll get to that in a moment. But it hits the ionosphere, instead of just being a 45 degree angle in or 45 out, it bends and it has a curvature to it as it goes through the ionosphere. And that we discussed. Okay, the ionization is mainly caused by the radiation from the sun, mostly, uh, uh, mostly ultraviolet these days, and, and x-rays when we're at the high point of the sunspot cycle, but x-rays are very, very low today. Our, this point of the cycle, which we're just about in the bottom of. And they say it might last another three to four years, but I hope not. Because I don't have too much more time left for another couple of cycles. <laughs> I started with cycle 18, I think, and that was the biggest, best one they've ever had on record. But unfortunately, I had a novice. I got in late. Um, okay. Um, it's caused by ionization of the sun, but it's not the ions that causes the propagation. It is the free electron that's out there once the atom has been ionized. So we're really, uh, really refracting it from the electrons. Uh, as long as the sun is shining and you have good x-ray and UV, you have propagation to a certain extent. It may not be right at the frequency you want it, but there is propagation almost all the time on some band. Okay, the ionosphere contains a number of layers that we're interested in. The DE, F1, and F2. Now, the D layer is an absorption layer. It does not do any refraction it only absorbs your signal. And it mainly absorbs the lower frequency signals. Uh, 
160 and 75 particularly, you notice how they get much weaker in the daytime. That's because the D layer is absorbing most of the signal and very little is getting through to the F1 or F2 layer. And you notice the D layer, oh come on, the D layer ends at sunset. The electrons recombine into atoms and there's no more absorption. The absorption can be very great or it can be minuscule. It can be 3 dBs. I've seen it listed as high as 70 dBs. Yeah, that's when you have pretty much nothing on the lower frequencies. The E layer is set as about um, 100 to 150 kilometers up and um, it does some uh, refraction but at least in the lower spot of the uh, lower part of the sunspot cycle it uh, doesn't do too much. Uh, you probably hear some E-layer propagation and don't really realize it's E-layer. And it, these days it'll be fairly short. But at the peak of the sunspot cycle, not only can you get excellent refraction on the E-layer, another layer at the peak of the cycle appears known as the E-sporadic. And a lot of you have heard, I think, of E-sporadic. Uh, it will, um, it can get as high as two meters, uh, but usually six meters is about the limit. Uh, it gives you excellent uh, propagation over about, I think it's 1,200 miles is the first skip, if I remember correctly. And um, if you've ever been on six meters, when you suddenly get asporadic, you'll, you'll know it because the local signals will go out and you'll start here in California, Oregon, uh, but I haven't heard that for years, not since at least the peak of the last cycle. Then you get into the F layers. The F layers are usually there 24 hours a day. However, the F1 layer and the F2 layer, obviously the F2 is higher than the F1, they combine into one layer at night, just the F layer. And uh, it'll be a lower layer than the F2. The F2 will peak at uh, noontime, suntime. But from about uh, 10 o'clock in the morning to about 2 o'clock in the afternoon is when it's best. Uh, Today was not a very good day, and I'll tell you about that a little bit later. I couldn't even hear Europe, other than just tell they were there. And usually they're 20 over, especially uh, uh, some of the Scandinavian stations. Okay, here's what happens. We transmit a, a wave front from transmitter A. It goes up into the ionosphere, is refracted down to point B. The, the ground wave has coverage, oh come on laser pointer, there we go. The ground wave will be very small and it will start getting weaker. The sky wave in this case is going to be your stronger one. And if you look at it this way, you never put out just one wave front. You put out multiple wave fronts at the same time. Imagine a dipole antenna. You're putting out wave fronts all the way around that dipole. Some are stronger than others. Obviously, the ones hitting the ground are, are not going to go very far, but they might combine possibly in phase with one of the others and give stronger signal strengths. But this shows you how you'll have uh, one wave maybe at... Uh, two degrees from horizontal, another one at three or four, another one at five or seven, and they'll, re they'll hit the ionosphere at a different spot. So therefore, you will have coverage, you'll have a footprint, maybe I should say, from this point to this point. That's why you don't just hear one station, because you have multiple wave fronts. Uh, this, the skip zone, a lot of people think of skip zone as where we're getting the, the uh, 
where we're working the stations, but the skip zone is where the signal is not detectable. In other words, it's skipping over that area. The uh, F2 skip is about 1,800 miles, as I remember, for the first skip. Uh, and if uh, the ionosphere is in good, good shape, you can get multiple skips. Once it skips over, it reflects back from the Earth to the ionosphere and does another skip. Of course, each one is weaker. Okay, these are the four definitions we need to really understand. Number one is the critical frequency. It's the highest frequency that will be reflected, in this case, to Earth when the transmitted signal is straight up. So you, as you point the, point the transmitter signal straight up, there will be a frequency at which the ionosphere will not reflect and it will just pass straight on through. And this, if you know the critical frequency, you can, you can judge how good the propagation is going to be on the higher frequencies. Now the maximum usable frequency, called the MUF, it's the highest frequency that can be used to communicate between point A and point B. Now it doesn't mean that at that point all propagation is going to go away. It just simply means that at point B the signal has started to decrease. Now, a further station, because you have a little different skip angle, can still be used, can still be copied, but they'll be getting weaker and weaker as you go up in frequency. The rule of thumb is that the MUF, the maximum usable frequency, is three times the critical frequency. So like today, 20 meters was terrible. But the highest the maximum usable got was about four. I mean the critical was about four. So three times four is 12. 20 meters is 14 megahertz. So that's the reason. So how did you know <coughs> that the critical was four? I looked it up. I'll show you in just a second. I read, I read the charts. I read the charts. I don't have today's chart, but I read the charts. On, now, actually the, the, actually, the maximum usable frequency is really about 3.2, but the rule of thumb is 3. It really runs about 3.2 to 3.5 most of the time. The E layer is a little bit different. It runs rule of thumb five times the, the E layer's critical frequency. The E layer's critical frequency will always be lower than the F layer. And the, the lowest usable frequency is the lowest frequency that can be used to communicate between point A and point B. Uh, for example, 20 meters, if you are working a station in California, you may not be able to work a station in, in mid part of the country. It all depends on where that skip zone starts. And the other one is optimum working frequency, and it's just it's identified to be about 20% below the maximum usable frequency. However, we don't have much choice on this. If the maximum usable frequency is, is say, uh, 15 megahertz, and you want to operate right 20% uh, below it, that gets down around 12 or 13. We don't have a band there, so you've got to pick 20. It's, it's something you have no control over. Okay, the wavefront. Here's where we start getting interesting. The wavefront leaves the antenna as a linear wave, either horizontally or vertically polarized. It doesn't really matter. As far as getting between A and B, they can be cross-polarized. It doesn't matter. When it reaches the ionosphere, it breaks into two circularly polarized waves. The main wave is known as the ordinary wave, and it's right circular polarized. The second wave is a left circular polarized, and it's known as the extraordinary wave. Kind of think of the 
vortex is coming off of an airplane's wings. One is clockwise, one is counterclockwise. This is a good way to think of it. Mm -hmm. That right there is <coughs> helpful. That uh, explained it to me like I've never been able to understand it. Okay. <laughs> that one sentence right there was worth me to me. Because yep. I've always struggled with that because I'm kind of an engineering type. Yep. And it always confused me. But I'm also a yeah. So now I understand. Right. It's just now I understand why one goes the other way. Yeah. Mo most people think the way the doing. horizontal wave or the whatever it is goes into the ionosphere and comes right back out. It doesn't. It breaks into two waves. Don't ask me the <coughs> physics of it. I don't know. But the vortex helped me a lot. Yeah. That's it. Now right. That's the best way that I could think of to explain it. Now, the extraordinary wave has a different propagation characteristic than the ordinary wave. The extraordinary wave is always, the, the critical frequencies, the extraordinary wave is always 600 kcs above, above the ordinary wave. There's 600 kcs difference in their critical frequencies. Once again, I don't know the physics on that. Um, anybody who has operated 75 meters, especially here lately, has heard when it, when you go from one to the other. Uh, Larry, wherever you are, you've heard it on the Virginia phone net. You'll, you'll be, the net control will be operating and all of a sudden it'll start going down. The signal strength will go down. The critical frequency on the ordinary wave has just gone below the net frequency. But you can still copy the net stations for quite a while because you're listening to them now on the extraordinary wave. The, dist the propagation distance has changed a little bit, but the signal strength is enough that you can still copy. Further on, if it keeps going down, forget it. All your close-in stuff is gone, mainly Virginia, let's say. But the guys down in Alabama, you can still talk to them great, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Or West Virginia, even. Florida. Florida, they're, they're, they're pounding in. So, do the ordinary and the extraordinary skip once they hit that? And yep. And if they do skip, then but they have, is, is it even from, you know, wherever it hits and it breaks yep, up? Yep, yep. It, it goes in, it, 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 it breaks up, it hits. I seem to remember, and I really need to look this up, that the extraordinary wave lags behind the ordinary a little bit. The skip characteristics are different. The skip on the extraordinary wave is shorter than the ordinary wave. Um, if I remember correctly, two skips of the ordinary wave take about four, three, three, three and a half skips of the extraordinary wave. It's just a different propagation characteristic. Question. Yeah. If you have a vertical incidence on the ionosphere. Mm -hmm. Ver a vertically polarized now? No. You're going straight, straight up. up. Okay. Right. And it's reflected, not refracted. All right. Does that generate two circularly polarized waves? Or no. Come back down no. Linear? It comes back down linear. Okay. That's the way I understand <coughs> it. It's only when you start refracting that it breaks up into the two. <coughs> now, of course, when you're, when you're shooting the signal straight up, you're also, you're not right at 90 degrees only. You have a little bit at 88 and 92 or whatever, because it has a little bit of beam width. So just because the critical frequency has, is at 4 megahertz doesn't mean that a station a little further away that you can't operate on 5 megahertz or 6 megahertz if you had the band. It's possible. Um, and like I said, the X wave always has a critical frequency higher than the O wave. Okay, I think the next one is, no, nope, next one is. Forgot about this slide. Okay, 75 and 80 meters is the band most used for NVIS. John, you, you've experimented with NVIS a little bit. Though, though I defer to Michael. Okay, Michael. <laughs> Have you tried to use it on 40 meters? <coughs> Pardon me. 
talking to the frogman, that's right. Yeah, we, uh, the Aries group did an MBIS field exercise a few weekends ago, and uh, critical, frequency, <coughs> critical frequency said that 80 would work and 40 wouldn't. And that's, that's right. Exactly, that's exactly what it, we you're, you're not. These days, you're not going to get any NVIS on 40 meters. It's going to be 160 and 7580 because of the critical frequency. Now, at the maximum of the sunspot cycle, you can, pro you can get NVIS on 40. It's even possible but very unlikely that you could do it on 20. Seldom does a critical frequency ever get to 20 meters. Um, I'll show you. I'll show you a chart in a little bit. So this is a uh, since it's, since your NVIS is a 90 degree vertical signal, you must operate in that critical frequency window because otherwise your straight up signal is going to go right on out into space. Therefore, 160 and 75, 80 are the best bands for NVIS. Okay, now we get into the interesting stuff. This is the Wallops Island um, Ionosan Atmospheric Sounder. Oh, that was your backyard. <laughs> nah, I wish it was. I'll show you a better slide to show the antennas in a minute. Uh, how many have heard the sounder? The Ionospheric Sounder. I was sitting there uh, last night before last, I guess it was on 75 meters and it was just pounding in. You ever hear a little noise, sound like a noise burst on 75 that goes voop, 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 four burst? That's the sounder as it, as it samples. I think, I, I, I'm not sure what the, what the spectrum sample is. I think it's 100 kcs or 500 kcs maybe. But anyway, on 75 meters, especially if you've got a quiet frequency, You'll hear four bursts. That's Wallops Island sounder. Every two, it it does it every two minutes. What's it testing? It's testing the critical frequency. It's looking at the critical frequency. Starts scanning somewhere around a megahertz, uh -huh. and goes up until wherever it ends. Uh -huh. Whatever the critical frequency is, that's where they stop. Okay, but that's the Wallops Island site, and here is Who runs the it? antennas. Who runs it? Uh. Good question. Probably NASA. It might be. I'll have to look that up. I don't remember. I, I get the information from, uh, I think it's Colorado University that puts all the charts out. Uh, but who, I, probably NASA, yeah. But that's the antennas, and it's enhanced so you can see the wire antennas or the sounder. Very narrow beam width, straight up. Let's get into the charts. Okay, let me get down here so I can use the pointer a little better. I took this first chart from the last maximum. Uh, we have frequency across the top and across the bottom. We have height of the uh, ionosphere on the left. Ignore this. This is simply the tilt of the layers at a particular time, whether it's north, south, east, or west, but you can forget about those. You forget about the bottom. It's just kind of noise. Okay, let's start at the low end. We come and we start sounding at about, let's say about 1.8 megahertz, we start picking up something. That's the E layer. So you start getting a, a repeat from the E layer, and then you come up, and you see this little squiggle? That always tells you where the critical frequency is for the E layer. In this case, it's about 3 megahertz. By the way, this morning was the first time I'd ever <coughs> seen the E layer uh, critical frequency and the F layer critical frequency almost the same. The E layer, I think, was 3.2, and the F layer was 3.6 or 7. I've forgotten whichever it was. Never seen them that close together. Anyway, you keep scanning on up and you get out of the E layer. Now, the E layer is going to absorb some of your signal. So even if the F layer was this low, you might not see it because a lot of signal is not going to get through 
the E layer is just going to be refracted and the skip will be whatever it is. So you continue on up. Now, here we go. You start picking up stuff from the F layer. And you get up here and you see these where it diverges? This is, this is the uh, o, o uh, frequency, this is the extraordinary wave, uh, the O wave and the extraordinary wave. Always separated by 600 kcs. And, and the, the, the line is drawn by the computer, and by the way, after the peak, this is just a retrace, so you can forget about this part of the line. But where the peak is, where the O layer starts going straight up, that's the critical frequency. In this case, it's just under 10 megahertz. Now this was 2014, April 1st, 2014. So the critical frequency of the F layer was pretty high. Now remember I said maximum usable frequency is about three times. 10 megahertz times three is 30. 10 meters was open. Um, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you in a minute. Oh, uh, I guess I go back. What this way? No, nope. that way. Okay. Oh, I should have mentioned that. The the sounder does not really measure the height of the layer. It's a time of flight. In other words, you set, the signal goes up, reflects off of the layer, and comes back down to the earth. That takes a certain amount of time. You divide that by two because you're only interested on one way, and uh, knowing the speed of light, you can calculate the height of the layer. Well, then what happens is, once it hits the earth, it's reflected back up, and it hits the same layer the second time. But it's twice, twice the amount of time, so it looks like there's another layer up here. It's not really. This, this is the same layer. Second bounce. Second bounce. And this is the third bounce. And sometimes you can see a fourth bounce if, if things are really good. And, and sometimes that second bounce will really be uh, very, very strong. Okay. This was March 26th of this year. Notice where the critical frequency is. It was right on 5 megahertz. Once again, the O layer, uh, the O wave and the X wave, 600 kcs apart. Pretty intense reflections from it, so you had pretty decent ionization of the F layer. Uh, pretty good squiggle here on uh, the E layer, about 2.8 a megahertz for critical frequency. So five times, let's say five times three is 15. You could probably get some E layer uh, propagation on, fifth, on um, 20 meters. But most of it's going to be from your, F, from your uh, F layer here. I'm just showing these to give you the, different, uh, the feel for different times. Okay, here's another one a little bit later in the evening on the same day, the, the critical frequency has started dropping. The E layer critical frequency has virtually gone away. Uh, the computer can see a little bit, but we can't see anything here on the chart. Uh, you have some very intense reflections from the F layer here, a good second bounce, a pretty good third bounce. Which, which tells me that this layer was highly ionized, but because the critical frequency was roughly five megahertz, three fives are 15, 20 meters is gonna be the only band that's open, the highest band that's open. The atmospheric tilt, we don't have to worry too much about, but in this case, it was tilted uh, a couple degrees uh, towards the south and a little bit more towards the, a little bit less towards the west. But that does not affect how we use these charts. The, the noise levels in the bottom, 
That's noise level. Once you, once you pass the critical frequency, all that the receiver is going to see is noise because nothing's being reflected back. The, this, is, this is showing the amount of noise it's receiving back versus the reflection from the layers. It sort of shows the signal to noise ratio. If we have a very, we, this is not something I picked up to do tonight, but if we have a very intense geomagnetic storm going, uh, the noise level should come up. You should have a higher noise level. And it could even exceed the reflections. In fact, all, I'm sure anybody who's been around a while has experienced uh, uh, a blackout, especially on 40 meters, 20 meters. Uh, a geomagnetic storm basically only brings the noise floor up. As far as practical purposes go, there's other things that happen, but as far as practical purposes go, it brings the noise floor up. So, let's see, one more, I think. Okay, this one was the fifth of this month, which was, what, three days ago? Five, four days ago. And this is about, this is about like it looked today. Uh, th this was at 7.30 in the evening. The critical frequency was, was 4 megahertz and dropping. And once again, your reflections, refraction, excuse me, from the F layer was pretty intense. But 40 meters was the highest band you, uh, well, 30 meters would be the highest band you could use because 3 times 4 is 12. You might get a little bit of local stuff on uh, 20, but not, not any DX. Uh, good, good reflections. Good three, uh, two good reflections there. So the band was, was pretty well ionized. The, the ionosphere was pretty well ionized, but it wasn't very good on propagation. So you got, what I do when I, before I check into my net at 7.30, I, I usually look at the chart here. And I'll, I'll look at it a half an hour before. And for example, if it's 7 o'clock, it's setting at 5. But at 7.30, it's setting at 4. I'm going to figure by within the next hour, it's going to drop to probably 3.2, which may mean that the net's over. Joe has experienced that. Jim, is just a quick question. Is that uh, relationship typically consistent, or does it have to do with, with how ionized it is? For example, if, it's, if there's more ionization, does it hold that it would would move to the left quicker or slower? Or is there not no. really a relationship? I don't know that there's any relationship with that. It, it, it's just how many free electrons there are. And uh, I guess, uh, hmm. I guess I'm, the question I'm not, in a nutshell is, does, it, does, that, does the time that it takes in, in your experience, does that seem to vary much depending on the, the ionization level? Not so much on the ionization levels, uh, as far as the charts go, but uh, it depends on how that critical frequency is either dropping or climbing, one or the other. Uh, you, can get, you can get a very poor reflection, according to this, and at 4 megahertz, and you're, I'm still good at uh, 3947, and, or you can get a, a high uh, ionization. <coughs> Mainly what it's going to affect is your higher frequencies. Okay. It's not going to affect so much uh, below the critical frequency. That's like current. That's current. That's crazy. That, that's pretty good. You got a lot of reflections there. Yeah. Uh, yeah that frequencies. But you're 5.5 five, you're 5. 5 right now. Five, more than that, 5.8. That's pretty good. So that would go all the way up to 10 meters almost. No. Three times. Three oh, times three, or 15. Three, three, you're all 16 three. or 17. Oh, okay. you're, you're, you're probably good for the 17 meter band there. Jeff, I've got to ask this question because I'm a QRP guy. Ask it. How much power are these guys running? Send these signals. How much power are they paying with? I'm not 
not sure. I, I try to find it. I'll have to look it up. I'm not sure. It, it's not a lot. Is it 10 kW? Or, oh, no. Or is it no. on I, I don't know. So uh, I, I use the reverse beacon network yeah. uh, a lot. That works good. QRP yeah. just to see. That works great. Right. Yep, that works great. So like in the morning, I'll do, you know, I'm running five watts on a wire antenna. Mm -hmm. And you can see the hits, a lot of hits mm -hmm. on, on 80 meters. Mm -hmm. Uh, half of them on 40 meters, mm -hmm. maybe one or, two, one or two on 30 meters, mm -hmm. and nothing on 20. Then you go up around noon, mm -hmm. of course. You're higher, more, you're higher, more so, higher, higher, the. Yeah, so I probably want to pay me out by noon to Canada, the mm -hmm. DD6 land. Yeah, but, more ionization. Exactly, but when they send those, when they send those pips out, are they using 5 watts? Are they using the KW? Let me put it this way. I'm pretty sure they're using under 100 watts. Because, you know, but how much, I don't know. When you're listening to broadcast stations... And, anyway, it's, it's not a lot of power. They don't need a lot of power. Well, yeah, I mean, my, right. my reverse beacon thing shows me that yeah. I don't need a lot of power. Right. Because yeah. the receivers are pretty sensitive. Okay. Question. When they're doing that chart, are they scanning a, a band of frequencies? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oops, too far. Where is it? I'm going the wrong way. Yeah, they, they start scanning, um, well, somewhere down in here around one on up to where they start picking up reflections. And they, uh, I don't know what the, the uh, amount of each scan is, whether it's 100 cycles, a kilocycle, I don't know what it is. But it has to be fairly big, at least in, I think it's got a bad switch on it. In, uh, it can be fairly big in this portion. But as you get up to the critical frequency, they probably want to start scanning closer together. Otherwise, you might actually miss the critical frequency. But I, I don't know what their, I have never researched that to see what their scan rates. Well, the scan rate has to be pretty good. They do it in two minutes. Huh? 14 bits of 80 megahertz. OK. And it's a 4KW class 80 pulse amp. 4KW? Okay, I wouldn't expect it to be that high. But. Okay. You told me something I didn't know. Some trucker uses. Yeah, that's a little bigger what y'all got there. Okay, there, there's the sun. Yeah, no. There's the sun at pretty close to solar maximum, last solar maximum. You notice we got a lot of sunspots there. By the way, rule of thumb, once again, when the sunspots get to 150, 10 meters is open. That was the old rule of thumb. Today, the sunspot count is, woo. <laughs> the sunspot count today is, well, today is not zero. When I took the, this was last week, I think I took that off of. There's a new sunspot that's just coming around the eastern limb. It's right about here right now. It's a moderate sized spot. The uh, solar flux index, index is now up to 79, uh, which is pretty good compared to what it's been. The lowest I have ever seen it has been 68. And here in the last, month or so, it seldom got above 71. So getting to 79 is pretty good, but it's not going to do a whole lot for us. It's not, you're not going to get 10 meters open. What's the highest you've ever seen? I don't know. But I read that the highest it's ever been recorded was 190. Okay. The solar flux index, measure the radiation at 10.7 centimeters. 
Why 10.7 centimeters? Anybody have an idea? Uh huh. It most, most closely matches what's actually happening to propagation if the flux is taken at 10.7 10, 10 centimeters. And of course, the higher the better, and seldom below 68. The sunspot number is sort of an old number that was used before they uh, had the SFI out. Once again, the higher the better. The solar wind is in kilometers per second. The lower the better, because that uh, the solar wind affects the magnetic field. FOE is simply the critical frequency of the E layer. FOF2 is a critical frequency of the F layer. MUF is maximum usable. The K index is the geomagnetic, geomagnetic field taken every three hours. Once again, the lower the better. The A index is simply the average of the previous eight K indexes, or sorry, a daily average of, of the magnetic field. <coughs> Okay, that's where we get, get it, and there's a lot more places you can get it. I have been using for years the solarham.com, but here lately the guy's been falling down a little bit and not updating it daily, which bugs me. The last time he updated uh, part of the data was the 3rd of April, which doesn't tell me much. So I have started going, for that part that he hasn't put in, I've been going to the WM7D.net because he will have it, have the, the daily one there. This is where I get the ionograms from, surfcolorado.edu. But you need permission to use it, other than the sign-in page. The sign-in page will almost always show you the most recent, recent ionogram. It'll be small, it'll be a little hard to, re to read, but it's, it's there. But all I did was I, and they tell you who to send an email to. I told them I find it very helpful for uh, me and my amateur radio work to know what the, especially the critical frequency is, so I can plan what frequency I'm going to use. And they came back and just gave me a username and password. So whether. Uh, HF Underground is good. Lots of information there. NOAA is also good. QRZCQ.com. The DX Cluster. How many of you know what the DX Cluster is? How many of you use it? I use it all the time. I do too. I love it. In the morning, that's one of the first things I bring up. Because you can tell, it, this are signals that are spotted on the band. A certain station hears a signal, they say, this, this station is on 14293, and uh, I'll go to 14293 and see if I can hear him. Maybe I can, maybe I can't. It depends on who spotted him. If, if the guy that spot him, spotted him was in, uh, say, uh, Eastern Europe, and he was in Western Europe, I may not hear him. But it's a good way to tell what's going on. And there are several others that are also very good. Um, hmm, I can't think of the other one. There's, there's one that gives you a chart and shows you the, the actual, uh, in, in a chart fashion, where each signal is coming from and going to. You've probably seen it, Dennis. I can't think of what it is. I didn't put it on here. Pardon? Yeah. Right. And uh, you can choose each band. And, yeah, see, and see what band, see which band is open from yeah. that, and you know you might see ten meters. There'll be a lot on ten meters, but it's all just around Europe, and nothing getting across the Atlantic. So you know, forget ten. Yeah, they color code the, yeah. the lines. Right. It's really easy. Yeah, it works nice. Like I say, there's an awful lot of sites on the internet that you can bring up. Just put in solar propagation, and you'll have hundreds of them. Okay. What's the best guide on so, uh, study guide on propagation? It's this one right here. Propagation in radio science. And it's a great 
manual. You can get it from the ARL bookstore or you can get it from Amazon.com. I, rec I recommend Amazon.com because you don't have to pay shipping. It's the same price on both of them, but from ARL you pay seven dollars and something shipping. Amazon, if it's over twenty-five dollars, which it's not, it's twenty-four ninety-five. <laughs> so you got to buy something else. Uh, you get free shipping. So that's the end. Is that the end?